in his background. Uh, where we are as far as formal replications are concerned is that Martin and his students did a so-called replication a uh, year and a half ago. Uh, Hal took the stuff to them and set it up with them and all that. We had the calibration issue. So they were seeing stuff that looked like what we were seeing after not seeing anything a year earlier. Uh, but it's alleged that it was significantly smaller than what we were looking at. It turns out a factor of four of that was the calibration miscalculation. Okay, so what they were seeing, we heard, have heard that Martin allowed us how they saw cross type signature events of several hundred nanonewtons, and that would be consistent with what we were looking at at the time. But they reported a null result. They took our device, we had provided them with a vibration isolation yoke that I, Hal talked about this morning. As soon as she, she left, they took the yoke out and bolted the thing directly onto their balance and not surprisingly, they saw vibrational effects. They were convinced that that was what was the, the cause of all of the signals. Uh, when Martin visited us a year ago, at the end of August, this past August, a year ago, he allowed us how this was what they were going to report out to the public. We got out our Polytech vibrometer that you heard about this morning and showed him that the device on our balance, which was producing thrust, which we had shown him, was not producing vibrational artifacts that would account for them. That indeed the balance was isolated from vibration in the Faraday cage. And since the Faraday cage, aside from the energy input, is a closed system, momentum conservation says you can't produce it quasi-stationary force on the balance without some vibrational thing getting to the balance. Okay, so that's where things have stood for the past year. We've been primarily interested in increasing thrust because that's what everybody wanted. As I told you this morning, David Brin made the comment at Huntsville last year that uh, this calibration and vibration stuff was all sort of interesting, but what about more thrust? That's what we've been focused on. Uh, what is the order of magnitude uh, of your thrust signal, Jim? Just order of magnitude? The thrust, let me tell you in a nutshell what we are looking at now. Mm -hmm. The And I will explain how we got it, and then I will let Paul and Michelle and Chip Atkins talk to you about how all of that came about and so forth. I'll show you how the things are built. Uh, the thrust signatures that we're seeing now on our thrust balance are quasi-stationary. We're looking at very high Q events which produce thrust impulses. And our balance is a low pass filter for such things, such signals. But even with it being a low pass filter, we're seeing tens to hundreds of micronewtons of thrust in the signals that we see. Okay. Thank you. If you, we can, and literally you can see these things under sufficient power move on the balance. You can literally see the forces moving the thing back and forth and so forth. Okay, and Michelle's gonna show you some pictures, some movies of that with motion enhancement and without motion enhancement. The most extreme of these things is displacements of the device, which is 125 grams by between a half a millimeter and a millimeter on the hardware that they're mounted on, which takes place in perhaps 100 milliseconds. And if you do a back of the envelope convo calculation, you'll figure out that that's producing millinewtons, if not more of thrust. So these, and the question is, how did that happen? Because we're running about the same power as we've been running all the way along, all the way from the stuff that was producing a few hundred nanonewtons on up. And the answer is very simply, I'm gonna hijack the screen and I'll show you how we do it. Okay. Uh, Hal's already alluded to this. 
Okay, there's my screen. Let me get on here and get to the right folder. Okay. All right. We got some movies, but we got some pictures here. Okay. Basically, the development that took place in early June was you remember that Hal told you about the sledge mount setup, uh, the two dowels, the, the device sitting on the dowels free to slide back and forth with stops to limit the motion and all that. Uh, and that when that mount was used, that the high frequency vibration that made it to the Faraday cage was significantly reduced from just mounting it on an L bracket, okay? You've seen the L bracket and rubber pads, okay? Uh, what we were running at the end of this was so-called Belleville washers, okay? This was our way of treating the heat problem. This is a reaction mass with Belleville washers glued together, which is pretty klutzy to tell you the truth. John wasn't in the machine shop, so all of this was done with hand tools. This is another view of the same device. You'll notice over here that there's a flange on this reaction mass. Basically what happened was in early June, I looked at that and I looked at the flange, which was there because Paul and Michelle were talking about a design that involved some really big, heavy, clunky Belleville washers. You know, I looked at it and I said, gee, to myself, gee, maybe you can stick the dowels through that and get rid of all of this stuff with L, L brackets and washers and stuff like that bolted to the back of the reaction mass. Okay. And that is in fact exactly what we did. Okay, let me go back. Where the hell is back? Here's back. Okay. Um, Basically, what I did was I said to myself, ha ha, if we make a reaction mass like this, okay, which is just a seven eighths diameter cylindrical reaction mass, nothing bolted to the back or anything like that, and you move the flange that you saw in the other case up to the interface with the PZT stack here, okay, and you put three holes through it like so, those three holes, what you can do is you can line that with Teflon and build an aluminum frame around it, okay? And the aluminum frame around it, let me get back here, will give you this as a proof of concept device. Okay, you'll notice that there are lots of washers under the bolts that hold the stack onto the reaction mass and so on. But here's that flange sitting on a 332nd steel dowel. There's another one down here and the third one in the background. Okay, little rubber O-ring stacked as stops for the thing to move, but other than that, there's no pressure on the flange, so forth. And we ran that and lo and behold, it worked. It started producing stuff in the tens of micronewtons range. Uh, okay. The dull moment involved was, gee, let's just move the, the mounting system, which in effect tries to decouple the high frequency vibrations from the rest of the apparatus. The idea here is that the high frequency vibrations are the ones who have produced the mock effect. And when you have them hooked up to anything else that tends to damp those high frequency vibrations, the mock effect goes down the toilet. So the rubber pads and all of the Belleville, the washer arrangements and all that were less than ideal because they all tended to attenuate high frequency vibrations. This system in principle should not attenuate high frequency vibrations. The only forces that would do that are frictional forces and that's why those things were lined with Teflon tubes, okay? and it was clear that this was a preferable way to go. There was a second dove moment in this, and the second dove moment was Jose's. <laughs> if Jose wants to tell you about it, I'm perfectly happy to have him over and take over and tell you about it. If not, I will 
Continue, Jose. Ah, Jose's not interested. Jose's not talking while well the flavor lasts. Okay, here we go. Uh, the second dull moment was G. Uh, it's really nice, you know, to have Teflon and all that, but Teflon on steel has a coefficient of friction of 0.01, which is a lot smaller than the coefficient of friction of brass on steel and so on. But maybe what we can do is make a phase three proposal to NIAC on grounds of introducing linear ball bushings instead of Teflon line tubes. <laughs> Because if we have linear ball bushings in there, given the high frequency vibrational environment, you don't have any stiction or static friction involved because of the vibration, which makes these things, if you have linear ball bushings sitting on those rods, essentially frictionless, which means that you are in effect, if you don't have anything pressing on the ears that hold the ball bushings, uh, makes the thing essentially the equivalent of doing this in free space. Okay, so you've seen the proof of concept. Linear ball bushings, which look like this. Okay, that's a linear ball bushing. Uh, Paul and Chip can tell you about how we got to these. They're two millimeter ID and four millimeter OD by five millimeters length, okay. And those things get stuck in the ears of, let's see, I'm not sure if I've got the sequence of this. Yeah, let me go on here. Those things get pressed into the ears of a reaction mass of the same sort that you saw with the proof of concept thing. Only the flange has been machined away except in the area of the ears. And the bushings are, in this case, pressed in flush with the reaction mass. The ones that are being built now, the flange that holds the ball bushings is reduced in thickness so that the ball bushings stick out about 30 thousandths on either side and they will ultimately be used to center some helical springs that are used with them. That sits on this thing here which is a what I call a shoe plate, the shoe being this red piece of plastic attached to the bottom of the plate, that gets attached to whatever hardware you're sitting it on. Ultimately, it gets attached to something that's on the vibration isolation yoke, because that's still part of the apparatus. And then you have another plate here, which simply goes over the other, other end of these rods, and you put spacers along between the screws, on the screws that hold the plates together. There are four screws in the four corners. And those four screws with the spacers determine, this is the device which is presently in the tank on hardware being put together. This is it sitting on that shoe plate on the rods, okay? And you can see the ball bushings there and there and so on, okay? You put on that other plate like so, and these spacers and washers determine in this case, it has helical springs on it instead of the arched springs that Hal showed you this morning. You can see that they don't hang properly on the uh, ball bushings because this one's sitting on the thing. As long as there's no pressure exerted by the springs when it's sitting there like this, on the ears, there's no trouble. It turns out that if you apply pressure to the ears, you know, of sufficient, you know, the sort that you would apply by compressing the springs significantly and all that, it screws up the behavior of the device and the effect goes away, okay? But as long as the springs don't apply any pressure on there, I'll show you a movie of what happens, in fact, with this device in a moment, okay? So this is the way it's held together. It's basically the device hangs. You turn this counterclockwise 60 degrees or 90 degrees, 90 degrees. And the two rods, this rod and the rod down at the bottom here, okay, 
are the ones from which it's suspended, and this is the one that guides the thing down there. Okay, now, okay, all right, we're finished with that. Okay, uh, proof of concept. Okay, question is, how do I, <laughs> uh, this is how I do that. Okay. Okay, I'm not going to show you the thermal stuff. I'll show you that this morning. Okay. Um, let me show you a movie of how that thing works on the device that we're talking about. This is PI. I'm showing you this not because it shows you a really spectacular run. You can actually see the end result of the runs in these two picoscope traces that are in front of you now. The one on the right is the one run at a little bit higher power than the one on the left. And you can see this thrust effect here. That's peak, this is a peak to peak. This is a full scale 40 micronewton scale. So you're talking about half a dozen micronewtons or thereabouts, okay, for the event. But what this does very nicely is it shows you very clearly that that thrust event only occurs when you have the second harmonic come into existence and with the right phase. I'm going to show you the movie now. Let's see what this comes up as. Okay. You want me to expand this? Yeah, I may as well. Okay, here we go. All right. Now, the FFT, there it comes on, second harmonic, there's your signal, and then the second harmonic goes away. Okay, let me stop this and run it back through that event again without all of the lead in. Okay, watch the second harmonic down here, there it goes. Now it's gone, okay? If you look at the waveforms over here, Pal's got the waveforms and voltage scales set for much higher power operation. Uh, so <laughs> there's not too much to see, I'm afraid. But if you look very carefully at the waveforms over there, actually I can move this slowly through them Okay, you can see the red trace in the waveforms. You have second harmonic presence and there's not much second harmonic presence in, well, there's a little bit in the blue trace, which is a voltage and so on. Okay, and then it goes away and all you see is the voltage trace, okay. Now, what you're gonna see when I, in about two minutes or less, yield this over to uh, Paul and Chip and Michelle, is you're going to see stuff that's at least as impressive as that. What you'll see is actually a movie or two, I hope. Michelle has got the movie or two going. Okay, let's see, let me collapse this. Okay, and get rid of this. Okay. Uh, what they are going to do is they're going to tell you about how we have gotten from, to me, just fooling around with the P PI Ceramics makes a, a disc that is similar to, but not exactly like the uh, Steiner Martin's 111 discs. She's unshared my screen. <laughs> yes. So you're seeing my mug as I say this. Okay, yes. All right. Uh, PI Ceramics makes material that has a higher stiffness, mechanical stiffness, and a lower dielectric constant slightly than the Steiner Martin's 111. The Steiner Martin's 111 produces really very, very nice results. Okay. Uh, we tried the, the American Piezo Ceramics materials, which is a little bit worse in stiffness 
and a little bit higher dielectric constant, and that doesn't work very well at all. Okay, so this was a test of other materials, and if you if we get done early enough, how can run the device, which is in there at one point, VRMS on the signal generator is the way in which we adjust the amplitude of the voltage across the device. But the first one, which showed a little bit of a wiggle, was at VRMS equal 0.5 volts. The one that I showed you the movie of is at VRMS 1.0 volts. And she's going to do VRMS of 1.2 volts if we get to a real life <laughs> demonstration of this. But before you see that, Paul and Chip and Michelle are going to take over and they're going to tell you all about how we got from early June with Jose's insight that linear ball bushings were the right thing to do uh, to where we are now. But where we are now, in a nutshell, is we're looking at real forces. You're going to see movies where you can see the thing actually move. George is doing a replication for us and his problem is going to be not detecting some minuscule force, it's going to be putting about 300 grams onto his very sensitive balance. <laughs> okay, uh, George, I have John Woodland working on reducing the mass of parts, but at 180 grams for the basic device with the frame and all that, which you see, which I showed in the sh slides before, that we're not going to mess around with. It's the same as the one that you did five years ago. Okay. <laughs> anyway, yes, you wish Martin were watching. Martin's not watching. Uh, okay, we've got replicators lined up. <laughs> okay, so so we'll know. George's problem is going to be. Uh, that he needs the thrust balance. The reason why you need the thrust balance is very simple. Uh, the chief false positive that's possible in this system is a slipstick action between the device on the linear ball bushings and the stuff, the ball bushings and all that, okay? And the way in which you eliminate that possibility is by running it on a thrust balance that's vibrationally isolated so that the vibration and the device itself does not get to the balance. So the quasi-static forces are the only thing that will cause the thrust balance to be displaced because of the conservation of momentum. Slipstick stuff in the device on the rods and all that will not cause the balance to be displaced from its natural position only real forces will do that. That's why the thrust balance is so important. Once we get past that, which will hopefully be sometime fairly soon, you can actually do this without thrust balance at all. You can just put them on, you can put them on a thrust block and uh, measure the motion of the device on the, on the rods, the uh, linear ball bushings on the rods, okay? and you don't need a fancy thrust balance or anything like that. And as I say, when you do the back of the envelope calculation for what Michelle's going to be showing you in a few minutes, we're talking about these things actually producing things at the millinewton level. And as Paul will be happy to tell you, if they're really producing stuff at the millinewton level, the expenditure of power which I didn't address in those displays, is on the order of a few tenths of a watt or less. <laughs> okay. It doesn't take much. The, the power in these things is almost entirely reactive. Okay. Power dissipation is what actually moves the thing, the force, the work that the forces do and all that. It's a few tenths of a watt, you know, for millinewtons of, you know, that turns out to be newtons per kilowatt in the standard. Uh, way of, of addressing the efficiency of these things. So what we're looking at is a system that will, is competitive with the best elect, electrical thrusters and all that perhaps better. In principle, this can be taken even farther than that I expect and so on. But heavy lift is not unreasonable. 
that it's being done, to be perfectly frank, with 19 millimeter diameter, two millimeter thick discs and a stack of eight and a little gizmo like this is frankly astonishing to me. I did not expect that we, we would be able to extract this sort of performance from what was basically a, a laboratory test device. It was not intended for serious commercial development. Okay, now that said, a question or two if there are a question or two, and then it goes to Paul, Chip, and Michelle. Nobody's got a George, you don't have any questions? Uh, 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 just wait, just wait. <laughs> <laughs> just wait. <laughs> okay, question, Paul. Okay, Paul, it's all yours. Wait, wait. I think Lance has a question for you, Jim. Huh? Lance has a question for you. Lance has a question. Go ahead, Lance. Yeah, I uh, a couple years ago, I, I think it was 2018 in Estes Park, uh, you know, we saw a suggestion that the time profile of, you know, the thrust versus time could be modeled as a, as a three body effect uh, and, and to rule out, uh, you know, whether this could be just a normal Newtonian effect. Have you guys uh, pursued that line? Have you uh, you know, ever looked at the time profile of the thrust? You're, you're, Lance, Lance, let me answer your question. You're talking about uh, the guy who did this so-called simulation? Yeah. Well, yes. Let me, was, yeah, chomper link or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, something like, yeah. Let, let me tell you what happened with that back channel. The back channel story on that is that he sent his code to then Heidi, who dissected it and discovered that what he had done was he had his engineered his code to get the display that he showed that he wanted. He had a preconceived conclusion and it was built in, baked into it. He had utterly unphysical parameters for this and that and the other thing and so on. And he got the result that he wanted. Okay, three body solutions still conserve momentum. And three body solutions cannot produce net thrust, no matter how you sling them around. Yeah, and I thought it, it raised a good point, you know, to my mind, you know, is this a way to validate or falsify, i.e., to do a three body simulation, let's say correctly, and and prove that if it was a three body that you would get a different time you know, signature. You know, mm -hmm. I had not thought about the time signature as part of the data until that suggestion, I think it's still a sound suggestion. I wondered if you guys had, you know, thought about pursuing it as a way to uh, no, buttress. No, to be, to be perfectly honest, Lance, the answer is no. It violates momentum conservation. You know, momentum conservation is a really, really important physical concept. You know, and it's, I, I hear you that it's an easy way of answering something like that, where you look at it from the computational point of view as an interesting problem because there are no closed form solutions for three bodies, exact solutions. You know. So yes, could you conceivably do something like, yeah, I suppose you could, but you'd still get the same answer in the end, which is no, you can't produce threats that way. Exactly. Uh... So when, and when you said it, it doesn't conserve momentum, were you talking about the experiment or the simulation? No, I'm talking about the simulation. The simulation itself does not conserve momentum. Okay. Mm -hmm. It can't, no system of N bodies in an isolated system can produce thrust is what it boils down to. That's what conservation of momentum says. Okay. Actually conservation of momentum. But, and you, you yourself said that your system doesn't produce steady thrust either. No, it doesn't produce steady thrust because we have a problem with this system. And Chip's going to talk about this. This system, in order to get the very large thrust, you have to go to a very high Q system. Okay. When you saw that thing progressing and all that, it goes blah, blah, blah like that. It's, it is, that's a low frequency response to a much sharper spike. And you'll see some of this in the movies that, are, that the others are gonna show you and all that. Okay, the problem there is all, the, best, yeah. the best you can do is a quasi-stationary thrust by sweeping through it 
slowly enough so that you can see the actual motion and all that, but fast enough so that it doesn't get damped out entirely by the thrust balance, low frequency, pa low pass characteristic. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Chip is designing an amplifier that is just going to hopefully lock onto and track the high Q signal so that you can choose a single frequency, turn the thing on, it produces thrust in a particular direction, and then it locks onto and tracks the resonance that produces the thrust, and you get steady thrust. Okay, but Chip's amplifier, which is suffering from the same sort of thing that all experimental stuff does, namely it's taking longer than anybody imagined. Chip's amplifier is not yet built, but it's on its way. And well, when uh, we get that... Uh, yeah, I don't want to send you too far down the rabbit hole. I know there's other people waiting and you have a schedule to keep, but thanks for allowing me to raise that issue. No, that's perfectly okay, Lance. We're not, we're not, we're not trying to sell anybody a pig and a poke. You get to see the movies, you get to folks fix at it and all the rest of that. But yeah. wait till you see these things actually move. That's really, you know, frankly, when, when we first saw them, Al and I first saw these things, when it's on a really good resonance and all that, literally it jolts the thing and you see it physically move somewhere between a half a millimeter and a millimeter as it sweeps past that resonance. Okay, okay, so yes. Yeah. Jim, can I, George, uh, the trace you showed, the red trace had a dip and then a peak and then a yes. dip and then uh, the, the outgoing well, part. Of, yeah. And can you explain why, as you're going down in frequency, uh, down Moving in frequency, down. you have a dip rather than a peak? It depends uh -huh. upon the phase the phase of the second harmonic with respect to the fundamental, George. Sometimes okay. when everything's a little bit different, you get ones that go up and then down, and then the tail of that is what you're looking at. If you look at the second harmonic in the FFT display is what you're seeing is an actual mechanical exponential decay of something that's been forced as first one and then the other direction, and then it tails off. That's the reason why I showed you that one. It's really simple. Paul and Chip and Michelle are gonna show you stuff that's much more complicated, okay? And I don't want you to get lost in the forest because of the trees, which is why I showed you that simple one. Okay, okay? thanks. Let the, hey, let, Jim. Let, yes, let them, let them go ahead and do their thing, okay? They've got a half an hour to do their thing, okay? That, who's next? I've, I've taken up more than enough time. Jim, who's next? Paul? I'll Paul. take it if you want me to. Go ahead, Paul. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, I'm going to share a screen. And there, no, 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 no. There I am right there. Okay, this is the, the, the run that... Um, Jim and Heidi were all excited about. And again, this is a, you know, this is the power on, this is the power off. Uh, this is the response frequency, no, the amplitude displacement response of the torque pendulum uh, when it's going through 40 kilohertz. In this case, again, the, uh, it's an impulsive force because you're drifting through. Okay, I'm gonna need to back up. The thing that, that Jose Rodel pointed out to everybody repeatedly is that the thing that you have to optimize in these stacks and these PZT mega drive systems is quality factor. You've got to maximize the quality factor, i.e. minimize all of the frictional losses in the system to obtain any kind of decent thrust production. That's what the ball bearings have, have done for the system they have removed almost all of the mounting uh, friction that was in the previous uh, mounting system with the L bracket and the, and the rubber uh, viscio damping rod. And your displacement should just come from springs, very high quality springs, either the, the arch variety or the coil variety. Uh, 
And that's what this current system right here is doing. Now, the first resonance that we come to is about a 40 kilohertz resonance. And you get this large spike. It's about 18 micronewtons that, it, that is pre-filtered, as Jim mentioned, the low-pass filtering of the um, torque pendulum. Uh, it's a passband filter of about 6 hertz. Uh, and you're doing a 1 kilohertz per second frequency sweep you only go through the active thrust generation portion of it uh, at uh, for maybe about oh, half a second at most. And so you are only seeing an impulsive reaction from the, th from the PZT stack on the system. And uh, it is based on those two elements, the bandwidth of the, of the, uh, the, the, the quality factor derived bandwidth of the entire mega drive mechanical, electromechanical system. And we're guessing right now, I, I made a wag, uh, an estimate of somewhere between a, a, a overall mechanical, electric, electromechanical quality factor of between 100 and 1,000 now. And that's why we're getting such strong responses with uh, you know, power inputs that are much less than a watt more on the order, and I say power, that's a dissipated power being converted into heat in the stack and the bearings and everything else. Uh, but since the quality factor is getting, is much improved over our previous attempts, uh, this is why we're starting to see what we think when we have an actual, oh, an answer to George. As Jim said, uh, I need to go to my next slide. Hang on, hang on. Where is it? Uh, Damn it, where are you? There. Uh, but da, da, da. Sorry, guys. All right. No, no. There. Okay. Now, um, I did a, the same plot that I just showed you. I, I, I dialed it back to five, five seconds into the run. So it's right at 40 kilohertz. There's the fundamental at 40. There's the second harmonic at 80 kilohertz. Now, the, the main thrust is generated on either side of the resonant peak between the, you know, the, the fundamental at 40 and the second harmonic and fourth harmonic, et cetera. Um, and it's all, it's very phase dependent on what side of the harmonic, uh, rather the phase, the resonance that you are on. Above it, it'll produce negative thrust. Uh, below it, it should produce positive thrust depending on your, your units. Um, so the problem with doing a frequency th sweep is that you not only, and I just thought of this, you not only are, you know, you're generating a positive thrust pulse and then a negative thrust pulse just as you go, go through the, uh, the resonant peak. So I agree with Jim, we're probably producing hundreds, if not thousands of micronewtons now. Um, and please note, the thrust will be proportional to the second harmonic amplitude relative to the first, you know, the fundamental. It's currently down about 26 dB. A and Jim is relying strictly on the SM111 and the other materials, uh, harmonic generate, self harmonic generation. We're not injecting these signals. They're being self generated because of the electromechanical interaction of the stack and the amplifier. So, that, oh, and over here, as you'll see, uh, my best guesstimate of the input power for this particular data run was about a, a hundred milliwatts or you know a tenth of a watt, which equates out to about yeah that's a point one newton per kilowatt if you just take the native eighteen uh, milli newtons that I noticed I, I mentioned before, but if you take all the pre-filtering and the bandwidth limit the limitations of excitation on the resonance and, and the, the plus minus swing that's actually happening, we're probably generating something on, or on the order of 500 to 1,000 micronewtons. And that's about all I have got. Oh, that's it. I think it's off to uh, Michelle now. Michelle. Well, I'm here. Hi, everybody. Um, I, thanks for your presentation, Paul. You covered a lot of stuff I was going to, so I'm going to make mine a little shorter. 
So let's see, I need to share my screen. Well, you could just say what I said again and just reinforce it. <laughs> <laughs> I'll do that right now. And Okay. There it is. Bingo. Well, um, this picture was taken from uh, 2016. I think everybody who was there remembers that. Oh, yes. It's a very nice. Um, where we started. To us. Yeah. Where we started was uh, this summer when I got involved was, was uh, the same thing that everybody been showing you. Uh, and aluminum mass, brass mass, L-shaped bracket, PCT stack. Um, I, I thought there had some limitations onto it. So it led us to, after some really good Zoom meetings, to say we will couple right to the center of mass of the device. We simply go to a null point in the vibration. And what this did is made a device very symmetrical in operation to look for a asymmetrical effect. So we built this, which is, um, uh, Jim has showed this to you, uh, with the brass mass, aluminum mass, PZT. And also Hal has showed you uh, why we did the center of mass uh, beam deflection back and forth with the weight so we could get an idea how much if the device was going to be set on uh, the stainless steel rods how much we would deviate this uh, the torsion pendulum and that worked out to about 0.5 millimeters or about 8.33 micrometers Let's see We came up with um, doing a centering springs because we didn't want to load anything up uh, with friction. So we did uh, 8,000 centering springs made out of guitar strings, looped them around, which is very kind of hard to do. So that allowed a centering action of the device on the stainless steel rods. And there was some research that was done on this, uh, Jose came up with saying that because of the friction, coefficient of friction and stiction of the linear springs, they shouldn't move until we hit at least 412 micronewtons. Well, we were already moving. So that led us to do some extensive work into finding out why they did move. And what we did find out is that in MEMS, with cantilever beams and stuff, one of the ways to get them unstuck is use vibration. So that's exactly what we were doing, is the vibration of the stack was allowing the linear bearings to float on the rods, virtually friction free. So we ended up with basically a symboled area like this, with a large mass on one end to stabilize the rods. And this is what we have currently. And I know everybody's expecting some videos here, so I'll get to it, but this is uh, what the current setup is. One of the things that I found interesting is that we were taking videos of the device operating and nobody had done that before. And if you take a video of that device, a high resolution video, you can set and process that video and get motion enhancement of that video. And this was done by researchers at MIT CSAIL and Quanta Research Institute. And uh, their, their company is called Lambda View. So I think I'll get right on to some video here. This is a video that we did, one of the very first videos that we did, and I'll repeat this. The device is operating, we're doing a 40 time enhancement of motion. You can actually literally see the springs vibrating. You can see the this springs. This is through the frequency sweep. 
of 45 to 25 kilohertz. You can literally see the springs vibrating in this, this image. Yes. That's... At a 40 times enhancement. The vice yes. goes through resonant and you can see it move. The whole thing is moving now. The whole thing is moving. <laughs> Rather violently. Well, it's 40 time enhancement. Well, I know. Yeah. So one of the other things you need to point out, Michelle, is that these double loops are, are you know, they're just on one ear in this particular instantiation. So that makes the, uh, the test article pitch up when it's... Yeah, it does pivot a little bit. And that's one of the things that uh, came out in these videos mm -hmm. was that we were asymmetrically connecting to the device and it was pivoting a little bit. Right. We need to load. You need to load each ear equally. Correct. Okay. Now, you just bailed share out. Share screen again. Without the springs. Took the springs off. Reset it up. Sorry for the noise. Okay. This is, we took the springs off and did another run later in the afternoon. So the device is just floating in. It's not centered into the device at, or in the brackets at all. There you go. Now it's going to get slung around. So if we didn't have the springs, that would, it's kind of like how it would end up doing. Mm -hmm. And remember that's 125 grand system. So that's what's getting slung around. Yes. So that allowed us to go to the... Right, Michelle, it's George here. Could you repeat that video? Oh, sure. Let me back up. There we go. Can you see it? It's yes. going now. Why don't you start over, Michelle, one more time. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Seventy eight bang, one millimeter. There's four millimeters back. And each time you go through a thrust reversal, it's going to reverse the direction of travel. George, did you get to see that? Yes, thank you. Okay. George, you're going to get one of these devices, maybe two, so you'll be able to do all this for yourself? Now, what we did do is we turned around. This is with a 40 time enhancement. to observe everything in the, on the video. And this includes bracket, this includes device. Is everybody seeing this? I'm also looking at the sidebands on the harmonics that are fascinating. Yeah. But with this enhancement, and this is going from 0.1 hertz all the way up to 15 hertz, what you're seeing is the response curves of the, uh, the torsion arm. You're seeing the device move the actual torsion arm back and forth. You can see as it accelerates and moves the, the torsion arm. Mm -hmm. This is kind of like having a laser vibrometer in your eyes. So we can evaluate the movements in the, uh, of the device, how, we, how it accelerates, how it compares to the spectrum analyzer, how it compares to the voltages, how it compares to the temperatures. So this in this kind great... of a case, in this case then, what's the point of having this on a thrust balance if you can just measure the displacement while it's on the sledge? That exactly. That and is also, something that 
that is something we are looking at. Yeah, and also, um, what kind of temperature does this thing, does the device get to during a run like this? And given the close tolerances of those rods inside the linear roller, but the linear ball bearings, um, is there any uh, thermal effects that you're going to get with the just as these components heat up to maybe increase the friction? For a 20-second run, Greg, it's typically about 5 to 10 degrees centigrade rise. That's not too much. And that's in the PZT stack itself. It takes a while for all that thermal, because of the PZT has such a lousy thermal conductor, you know, one watt per meter Kelvin uh, or less. Uh, it takes quite a while for it to percolate into the brass and the aluminum. And how, do, how, are, you, how are you getting that number? The, the, the temperature rise? Yes. Thermistor on the aluminum end cap of the PZT stack. It's the green Thank trace you. at the bottom of the strip chart reporting, Greg. Green the trace. He has it set up so that it doesn't display the trace until after the run's over. Oh, I see. Yeah, I didn't. I, I cut the video off because of the processing time here. But yeah. uh, uh, Paul is correct. It only rises about 5C. Uh, it's George here. Can I ask a question? Thank you. Um, I thought Paul said that when the second harmonic uh, reached a larger proportion of the fundamental, you get the largest thrust. Um, if you repeat that slowly and stop it, um, the second harmonic seems to stay fairly constant and actually goes down when that large thrust signal occurs. George, you're dealing with multiple filtering elements that are skewing the time base. The other thing, George, is that the thrust is a lagging indicator of what's going on in the FFD. So okay. you get a large second harmonic and it looks like it happens just before what you see in the thrust trace. Okay. Now so on this, you, go ahead, I'm sorry. sorry. One more quick question. Have you actually measured, well, has anybody measured in some way before any of the, any of the, uh, before the device is active, have you measured how much resistance is being offered by those wires that are all hanging there running into the device? <laughs> there is some tension involved with those cables that probably need to be improved, Greg. Probably You're absolutely, right. absolutely correct, Greg. Uh, we have um, tried to end up doing uh, loops on those wires so that the impact on the device would be minimal. Yeah. The wires, Greg, are soldered onto the electrode tabs close to the aluminum cap so that they don't interfere with the rest of the hardware as much as possible. Mm -hmm. So this event here at 0.1 or a tenth of a volt works, it pegged our system at uh, all about 100. About 120. 100, yeah, somewhere around 120 micronewtons. Oh, that's yeah. right. The, the voltage yeah. scale on the right side and the peak, upper left picoscope trace is 12 volts. And that's yeah. where it's, it's uh, flat tops because of the power supply limitations on the instrumentation. It's being clipped by the amplifier and the position sensor, mm -hmm. which has mm -hmm. plus or minus 12 volt supplies. We didn't expect to run into this, but uh, no. we did. <laughs> we're, we're so sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I'm going to go to, <clears throat> now we debated on whether to show this one or not, but uh, this is this is with the springs. Uh, the helical springs. The helical springs, yes. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, but it showed such a wonderful trace because of all the the video processing work that we did prior to this. It showed us that we needed to go to a, like a, a helical spring to capture all the ears on the device so that we could make it more uniform as far as transmitting 
uh, its thrust event into the torque pendulum. We have new springs on order. This is a 0.1 hertz to 15 hertz video enhanced movement. The chaff you see on the, on the, on your, your, wait a minute here. Are we sharing? Yes. Yeah. Okay. I'll stop it and pause it here. Here are the new springs. Uh, since this was just done, we didn't have an opportunity to get the right ones. <laughs> the right ones. So, we from a McMaster car, we got the best we could, and the tension on these springs are a hundred times the wire springs that we used. Right. The gold-plated piano wire. I know. Like so, so there shouldn't be really any movement at all because it constrains that device pretty well. Um, we do have new springs ordered, a little bit softer touch. Uh, right I don't, ID. Yeah. And they will allow us to set them in here so that we, there's no touching of anything. So, but I wanted to show you the dirt so we could see the sky. <laughs> so here we go. Now this is the one that showed the two thrust events. The one was the Mach effect taken effect and the other 30, one was the mechanical. Right, 40 kilohertz and down at around 30 kilohertz. 30 kilohertz, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You can now and the, the wires, go ahead. I'm sorry. The interesting thing about this is, is there's absolutely very little movement of the device itself. Right. Here, can you see this again? Now I'll play this one again. Back this up. Here's our first thrust event right here. Mm -hmm. Now, Mr. Shell, in this particular view, upper right corner where you have the video, is that um, image, is that motion enhanced or not? No, it is not. Okay, that's why I'm not seeing much, okay. No, you. you will not see much here. Well, the spring, you might not see much at all because the springs are like 100 times of what they should be. Exactly. But the interesting thing is, is you still deviate the torsion pendulum. Mm -hmm. And there's almost no center of mass movement at all. No. The force effectively is acting directly on the, on the uh, balance. And the interesting thing is, is the balance does not respond that well. If you take a look at here at the ring down effect, this is the natural resonant frequency of the torsion you, arm. You can tell the six, six hertz ring down. Right here, yes. This definitely is not. You can see the thrust event going up, the thrust event being driven down and back. <coughs> and that thrust event is way different than the natural resonant frequency of the, of the system. Yeah, right. Okay. Um, so, who's next? Chip. Chip. Good. You're off, Shell. <laughs> Take a deep sigh. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>